side. Sorry about that. Happy Resurrection Sunday. We have so much to celebrate today. You know, have you ever had the experience of uh, going to a movie theater? You know, some people still do that occasionally, actually go to a theater. And you were going to watch a movie and you probably saw like 20 minutes of previews, uh, is how it went, which the goal of every movie preview is to grab your attention, draw you in and leave you saying, I have got to see that. And have you ever had that experience happen where, where you saw a preview and you were like, I have got to go see that movie. And the anticipation built and you bought the tickets and you went and you saw the movie and it was a huge letdown. Has anybody ever had that happen? Like you went to see Frozen or something like that. And it, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Children, I'm kidding. Um, yeah, it's happened to me where this, this preview just overpromised the movie underdelivered. And you walk away from it, not only disappointed, but feeling led astray because you put, you put time into it, you put money into it, and you got nothing to show for it. So you're left frustrated. It just wasn't what it was cracked up to be. I think sometimes gamers feel the same way. If you like to do gaming, then you need to know the, the trailers for gaming come out because they want you to pre-order the game. They, they want you to get the game in advance. It's all about sales and marketing. They want you to get this. And GNET uh, Marketing, talking about that, just said, you know, it's a little tricky because you know, fans are seeing footage of the game that they will eventually play, but it's been romanticized. It's been dramatized to capture attention and get you to buy it. And they said it's tricky because... You don't want someone to feel taken advantage of if they get the game and it's promising an experience that, that you won't have. And maybe that's happened to you as well with, with gaming. You just felt frustrated. You were disappointed. It, you, it, you felt misled because this preview of coming attractions of what was to come, it overpromised and the actual thing underdelivered. And you're just left frustrated with that. And, and I'm just wondering today if it's possible, no matter how small a part of you feels this way, or how large a part of you feels this way. I'm just wondering if on a day like this, Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, a Sunday where we talk about the promises of new life and empty graves and resurrection power and brokenness being restored and, and beauty from ashes, I'm just wondering if there may be a part of you today that came in on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday, kind of feeling the way you feel when a preview overpromises yet underdelivers, and if there's part of you just is thinking, is this just one more example today? Just one more example of someone overpromising and underdelivering? Is it just one more hype session followed by a, a dose of reality that's a huge letdown for you? Is this just one more example of something that looks good on paper and it sounds good, but really it it falls short? I'm just wondering if there's maybe a part of you that's saying, I know we're celebrating this. I, I, I know we're excited about this. I mean, we, we're growing expectations. We're building anticipation. We're singing songs of celebration. But am I just going to leave feeling let down in the end and disappointed by tomorrow? And I guess the question I'm asking is, how can you know that all of this talk about new life and a better future and, and brokenness restored and beauty from ashes, how can you know that it's justified? How can you know that, that the, the promises of a better future will actually play out? What should give you confidence in this? And I just want to ask that you would look honestly with me at a couple things today that I think could build your confidence that can help you see that the, we have some previews of coming attractions that, that can be trusted. And if you look at it honestly with me for just a moment, I, I want you to think about the miracles of Jesus for a moment. The miracles of Jesus. Jesus' miracles and healings are a preview of coming attractions. Now look, there were multiple reasons why, why Jesus performed miracles. I mean, I mean, on the one hand, he did it because he had compassion for human need. I mean, his heart broke for people. So like in Mark chapter one, when he saw a leprous man who was isolated from his community and forced to live in a lonely, a lonely existence in an isolation, the text says that filled with compassion, Jesus reached out and touched him. His heart went out to that guy. That's one of the reasons Jesus did miracles. 
Another reason Jesus did miracles is because the Bible tells us that, that God used that to give credibility to who he was, that he was the son of God. And so in Acts 2, it says, Jesus of Nazareth was a man accredited by God by miracles, signs, wonders. Those miracles, those signs, it gave credibility to who Jesus claimed he was and, and who he said he would be. And so the, the miracles did that. But there was another reason that Jesus performed miracles. And, and the, the reason for that was because Jesus was providing us a glimpse of the world that is to come. Every miracle is a glimpse of the world that is to come. Have you ever had the experience, whether you were driving or just riding in a car down a county lane highway at night when it's cloud covered, no moon, no stars, no lights, and the only thing you can see on that road are the headlights of your car, and that's as far as you can see, you see nothing else. And you're driving down this dark road late at night, and all of a sudden, lightning flashes across the sky, just lighting up and illuminating the landscape. You've seen the, the kind of lightning where it feels like daylight, daytime for a moment. And in that moment, you get a glimpse of everything around you and all of a sudden you see rolling hills and you see a barn in the distance and cattle out there in the field and you see fence rows and trees and landscape. And all of a sudden, you get a glimpse of what's out there that you couldn't see before. Miracles are like that. The miracles of Jesus illuminated, illuminated the landscape. It was the miracles that showed us that if you think this is all there is, that this is the way it has to be, that it won't get any better than this, the miracles illuminate for you a world of other possibilities, spiritual reality that that God's kingdom is here. God's kingdom has come. This is what God's kingdom looks like. That's what miracles were showing you. His beauty, his possibilities. And, and so on the one hand, miracles look forward, but on the other hand, miracles look back. Miracles look back to the original Garden of Eden where everything was perfect. And, and man and woman lived in perfect harmony with God and with each other. Before there was sin, it's a look back into that perfect Eden where everything was harmonious and right. But miracles, on the other hand, also point us to the future to show us what is to come. It's a glimpse of what heaven is like, the new heaven and the new earth that Revelation 21 and 22 talks about where everything's made right again, where there's perfect harmony and there's perfect peace. I love the way Tim Keller says this. He says, we modern people think of miracles as the suspension of the natural order, but Jesus meant them to be the restoration of the natural order. The Bible tells us that God did not originally make the world to have disease and hunger and death in it. Jesus has come to redeem where it is wrong and to heal the world where it's broken. His miracles are not just proofs that he has power, but also wonderful foretaste of what he's going to do with that power. Jesus' miracles are not just a challenge to our minds, but a promise to our hearts that this, this world we all want is coming. The world we all want, it's coming. I mean, is this world the way it is right now? Is this what you want? No. But every miracle is a glimpse that the world you want, that world is coming. It's a promise to your heart that on a universal grand scale, Jesus has come to establish the new heaven and the new earth, and it is yours if you put your faith in him, if you put your trust in him, your belief in him, it is yours. Like lightning, miracles light up for you what God is doing that you could not see, what his kingdom is going to be like. And so when you look at some of those miracles, and I, I know Mark chapter four and five are some of my favorite passages look at the miracles of Jesus. And when you look through all of those miracles, one after another, you begin to see a glimpse of what it's going to be like, the new heaven and the new earth. Like in Mark chapter four when Jesus calmed that furious squall and the boat was nearly swamped and all was still. It was just a glimpse to show us that, that in the new heaven, the new earth, there, there will be no more chaos and raging seas. In Mark chapter five when, when Jesus cast a legion of demons out of a man, it showed us what it's gonna be like when Satan is once for all thrown into that abyss and he has no 
power. He has no sway over anyone anymore. In Mark chapter 5, when a woman reached out to Jesus because she had been bleeding for 12 years and no doctor could cure her and she was desperate and Jesus restored and healed her body. It was just a glimpse to what's going to come when there's no more disease. There's no more sickness. In Mark chapter five, when Jesus came and raised the synagogue ruler's little 12 year old girl back to life again, when he breathed life into her lungs again and raised her from death to life, he was showing us a glimpse of what it's gonna be like in heaven, in the kingdom of God, the new heaven and the new earth, when there is no more death. There is no more mourning. He was showing it to us. The miracles of Jesus were just proclaiming for us that there is a day when there's no more disease, there's no more death, there's no more demon possession, there, there is no more. How does that sound to you? Man, that sounds great. That's what we long for. Jesus came to make that a reality for us. And when he comes the second time, we will see it in all of its fullness. So in Luke chapter seven, verse 22, when John the Baptist was in prison and, and he, he's the cousin of Jesus and he sent messengers to, things weren't working out the way John, I think, thought they were gonna work out. And he sent messengers to Jesus to say, now, hey, just wanna confirm, you are the Messiah, right? And Jesus told those messengers, you go back to John and you report to him, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the leprosy are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised. Good news is proclaimed to the poor. You let him know that. You go back and tell John, the children who have never seen with their own eyes, they've never seen the rays of a sun, they're now looking into their mother's eyes. Go tell John that. You go tell John right now that that teenage boy who spent his whole life on a cot, he just signed up for soccer. Go tell John that. You go tell John right now, those people with leprous skin falling off their bodies, they're unclean, untouchable, living in isolation. They're hugging their neighbors and little children are sitting in their lap. Jesus said, you go tell John right now that those people who have never heard a melody with their own ears, they're singing harmony right now. You ought to hear them sing. You tell John that funeral scheduled for Friday, you know that funeral for that little girl that's supposed to be on Friday, canceled. She's gonna be running a 5K with her friends. You go tell John right now that the down and outs, the broken, the marginalized, they're hearing and they're receiving the good news of the kingdom of God and they're responding and they're being restored. Do you want that? Do you want that? Because that's what the kingdom of God looks like which is what really makes Jesus' next statement very curious when he said this, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. Why would he say that? It just seems so oddly placed because I don't know anybody who's like anti-blind people seeing or anti-lame people walking. So why would he say, so blessed are you after all these miracles that you don't fall away on account of me? He's saying it because he knows John the Baptist is in prison. He's not getting out. He's gonna die there. And Jesus is telling John, you, you stay true to me, you stay faithful to me, and these glimpses you're getting of the kingdom of God, yeah, you're, that, that's not the full reality right here and right now. Jesus hasn't even gone to the cross yet. He's gonna experience his own death and suffering. Jesus is saying, this is the glimpse of what is to come, and if you stay faithful to me and you stay true to me, this is what the kingdom of God is like. This is what you will see when everything broken is restored. So John, you hang in there. There is a heaven, and this is not it. So it may feel disappointing right now. You may see some losses right now. But you stay faithful and true to me. And the heavenly reality will be yours. There's something about the glimpses that Jesus gives us through his miracles that gives us hope of the future and what is to come. And, and he's just, John, you're, this is just a taste of what the kingdom of God is gonna be like, so trust me. And I'm just wondering, maybe you know someone right here, right now, maybe it's you. And because of the pain and the suffering and the grief and the hardship you're going through in this life, you're tempted, or maybe you already have, given up on God. And Jesus is saying to you the same thing he said to his cousin John. Blessed are you if you do not stumble on account of me. You are gonna have some trouble in this life, but trust the signs, because I give you a glimpse of what is to come. He's inviting us to imagine what is to come. 
It's good to imagine. Use our imaginations. Albert Einstein, he said, imagination is everything. It's the preview of life's coming attractions. Imagination, it's the preview of life's coming attractions. The miracle of, of Jesus inform our imagination. Give us a, a glimpse, a picture of what this is like so we can see things we wouldn't see before. And, and when you let it inform your imagination, you realize there is no dissatisfaction in heaven. No one goes there and says, man, the preview was so much better than this. The Bible described it so much better. No, it's the opposite. You, you can't even imagine what's there for you. 1 Corinthians 2.9 says, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived, the things God has prepared for those who love him. You can't even dream this stuff up. You can't even imagine what God has for you. Do you love him? Are you pursuing him? Are you seeking him? If you are, this will surpass your wildest, holy, sanctified, glorified imagination. You can dream it up and it still won't be good enough. And if you get to a place like that where you're using your imagination, allowing the miracles of Jesus to speak into your life, and you're like, you know, I'm still not sure. I'm still not sure I can have confidence or know that there's gonna be a better future or there's gonna be a restoration of brokenness or there's, there's gonna be a new heaven, a new earth one day. And maybe, maybe for some reason you're still wrestling with that, even after knowing and hearing the eyewitnesses and seeing what Jesus did, that I would just invite you today whether you're here in person or watching online, I would invite you right here, right now, just to be honest with what I would consider the greatest sign, the greatest sign that something better awaits you, and that is the resurrection of Jesus. The resurrection of Jesus, it is the greatest preview of coming attractions there is. Dead people coming back to life never to die again. My wife's cousin Kyle had a four-year-old daughter, this is years ago, and she wanted a pet. Anybody have a kid who's, who wanted a pet? And uh, you had to navigate this, it's tricky. And uh, so he told her she could have a pet, but there was just a couple conditions. And these were his conditions, he, he said to her, the pet cannot bark, meow, or make noise. That was the first one. No barking, meowing, or noise. This pet cannot do that. Secondly, the pet cannot shed. So no fur, you know, hair, that kind of thing. And the third one, it had to cost less than $5. That's his only stipulations, conditions he had for getting a pet. That was it. And so after some thinking about this, his daughter decided to she settled on a goldfish. And so they went to the store to get the goldfish, which I'm sure is exactly what Kyle had in mind. And they, they picked up the goldfish, and he said there was a sign in the store, and here's what it said, three-day guarantee, no questions asked. He's like, that was the best stewardship he could ever imagine when it came to getting a pet for your kid. It's just three-day guarantee, no questions asked. That sounded great to him. So they got the goldfish. She named him Nemo, and they went home. She wanted to play with Nemo, of course, as soon as they got home. And he's like, how's a four-year-old play with a goldfish? It's a little tricky. But uh, she wanted to go swimming. They had a pool. And, uh, she, of course, she wanted Nemo to go fit, swimming with them. And he said, well, that's probably not a good idea. The chemicals in the pool may not be real great for Nemo. So how about we put Nemo in a glass, put him on the edge of the pool, and then he can kind of participate with us while we're swimming. So that's what they did. Nemo was in the glass, put him right on the edge of the pool, and they splashed around and played together. And, of course, frequently checking Nemo and saying hi. And Nemo seemed very interested in what was going on. He was just facing, looking at the pool. In fact, looked a little jealous, like I'd, I'd love to be in the pool and doing that. And Kyle said, all of a sudden, while they were playing, Nemo just flopped right out of the cup and went into the pool. And was just, just darting everywhere. And he knew. He had a matter of minutes to, to catch this goldfish. And uh, he, do you know how hard it is to catch a goldfish in a pool? <laughs> Kyle said, it's harder than you think. And so sure enough, it was impossible. So he just had to wait it out. And finally the time came and Nemo kind of went belly up and floated to the top. He got Nemo and put it in a sack and went right back to the store. I mean, three-day guarantee, no questions asked. And so he goes back to the store and 
and uh, walks in. The same lady that had just sold him the goldfish that morning, she was still working. And she's just like, oh no. He said she then violated her own policy. She said, what happened? Hey, no questions asked, but he... So Kyle said, I had to tell her the truth. And I just said, he drowned. <laughs> just, he drowned. Oh, she said, he drowned. And so he came out with a new fish. Wouldn't you love it if all of life was like that? A guarantee? Come in dead? Leave new? Leave brand new? You know, Easter says you have that guarantee, right? Come in dead? Leave new? In fact, it's even better than what happened to Nemo. Because Nemo died, he stayed. A new fish. It was a new fish that came out. Your guarantee is better than that. The resurrection of Jesus, the promise of Easter is that you come in dead, but you leave brand new. That's what the resurrection is saying to you. The only thing that you and Nemo have in common is death. It's how the Bible describes you. Dead. In fact, you have experienced or will experience three kinds of death. The Bible says that you're, first of all, you will experience physical death. Every person dies physically because of the sin of Adam and Eve, starting with that in Romans 5, Romans 8, 10. Because of their sin, the curses on our world, everybody dies. Everything dies. That's physical death. But there's another death that we are experiencing, and that is spiritual death. Separation from God because of our sins. Our personal sin separates us from our God and we are spiritually dead, that's how the Bible puts it. We are separated from God, our life source. And so we're spiritually dead. And if you're spiritually dead, and that doesn't change, then the third death is eternal death. Because we've sinned and rebelled against God, we will suffer his wrath. Hell is described as what life looks like when God is no longer in it. What it looks like when God is no longer present, no longer with you, that is hell. It's being as separated from God as you can be. And that eternal death, the Bible says the wages of sin is death, Romans 6, 23. That is what we receive because of our sin. Physical death, spiritual death, eternal death. You're dead. You're guilty. It's, it's why Jesus went to the cross. Jesus conquered death with his own Death, that's why he went. That this, this God who is perfect and sinless becomes a man and he goes to the cross so he could be a substitute for us, so he could be a ransom for us, exchange his life for our life. He goes to the cross so that he can be the object of wrath and suffer the full brunt of the sin or the punishment that we should have received. Jesus took it upon himself. He suffered it for us, which is why from the cross, right before he died, he says with every amount of breath he has left, it is finished. It's done, it's complete. What's he talking about? The payment for sin, the suffering for sin. It is finished, the payment, that was done, that was complete. But redemption was not complete, just the suffering was complete. Redemption wasn't complete. Bringing you back to God, giving you new life, that wasn't complete, that wouldn't happen until three days later. When we read this in Matthew 28, where it says there was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it, and his appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow, and the guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. And the angel said to the women, do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He's not here. He is risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay. Then go quickly and tell his disciples. John's account in John 20, beginning verse 3, says, So Peter and the other disciple, we know that was John, started for the tomb. Both of them were running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. He bent over. He looked in at the strips of linen lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter came along behind him and went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips of linen lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in its place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple who'd reached the tomb first also went inside. He saw and believed. 
They still did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had to rise from the dead. He had to rise from the dead. For our redemption to be complete, he had to rise. Why? Because without his resurrection, death is not defeated. Without his resurrection, we don't experience the resurrections we need. There's two resurrections that we need that don't happen unless Jesus came to life again. The first one is a spiritual resurrection. We need our sins forgiven. We need our guilt removed. Ephesians 2 says you're dead in your sins, but because of God's great love for us and he's rich in mercy, he made you alive with Christ. If Jesus hadn't risen from the dead, you're not getting made alive with Christ. He made you alive with Christ. It is by grace you've been saved through faith, through your faith. This is what he's done for dead people. Or you read a text like Romans chapter six, which describes that moment of, of life surrender when you're baptized into Christ. And he says, don't you know that all of you who are baptized into Christ, you are baptized in his death in order that you could be united with Jesus in his death. Is that all it says? No. And in his resurrection. We experience new life because Jesus rose from the dead. In 1 Peter 3, in talking about baptism, it says it saves you by the resurrection of Jesus. It's his resurrection that makes my spiritual resurrection possible. It is needed. In fact, at 1030 today, there's going to be three of them, three baptisms coming up at 1030 today, people who are making that decision to follow Jesus. And if you have a spiritual resurrection, that's the first one you need. But because Jesus rose from the dead, you will also experience a physical resurrection. Every one of you will die. And when we die, if we die spiritually, we need a spiritual resurrection. If we die physically, we need a physical resurrection. When you die, your spirit goes into the presence of Jesus. Your body stays here. And your spirit is longing for that day because your body and spirit, when the two will be united again. And when Jesus comes back at his second coming, those who are in their graves, the Bible tells us, will come out. And they will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. They will meet up and their spirit and body again will be joined together with a new body, a vibrant body, a heavenly body. In 1 Corinthians 15, it says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the firstfruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead came also through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ, say it with me, all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ, the firstfruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Jesus is first. He's the first to rise from the dead, never to die again. And because he's the first, there'll be others to come, second, third, fourth, and so on, because the resurrection of Jesus is a guarantee. It's a guarantee that there will be other resurrections. And so I want you to just to pause for a moment. I want you to think right now of those who have passed on over the last couple years here at Northside. You have had family members that have passed away, and I want you to think right now about those who love the Lord and They're in the presence of Jesus. And I want you to think, I want to use your your imagination for a moment, that glorified imagination, to imagine them with a new, vibrant, perfect body. Because that is what's to come. The resurrection of Jesus gives us a glimpse into that. I want you to imagine for a moment. So imagine Russ and Sandy Adkins. Just imagine Life being breathed into their bodies again. Think of Norma Willis and Barbara Dawson. Just think about that. Life. Resurrection. Think of Bob Jackson and Lawrence Price. God calling them out of those graves again for the body to rejoin the spirit. Think of Jerry Kirksey and John Rainey. Think about what Easter promises them. Think of Bill Keffer or Micah Daniel Philly. Think about what the resurrection means for them. Imagine Christian Bartnick or Matt Brown. Think about what resurrection power will do for them. Think of Kalen Troy or a Jason McKnight how God takes things that are broken and dead and brings to life again. Or think of Wanda Cole or Patsy Control.
if you allow the resurrection and the miracles of Jesus to give you a glimpse of what the kingdom of God is like, then it should not be hard for our imagination to picture them in a new, glorified, resurrected body because of the resurrection of Jesus. And it should fill you with anticipation and expectation that your loved ones will experience what Jesus has already experienced. And that is not over-promising. That is telling you of a future reality that is theirs. You're going to put your trust in and you can have confidence in it. It's the resurrection of Jesus that makes it possible for someone like Craig, who was dying of pancreatic cancer without any hope left of medical treatment, write in his blog that he was looking forward to eternal life. And one of the last things he would write while on this earth was, God is good. What brings a 49-year-old with three children who's dying of pancreatic cancer to write such things? The resurrection of Jesus. You don't write that without Easter. You would never even think of that without Easter. And you begin to realize Jesus was just the first of many more to come. That's the hope. That's the expectation. That's the anticipation we have. Max Lucado said it this way, God will issue, one day God will issue an irresistible command. The one who called Jesus from his grave will summon all human bodies from theirs, and they will come. From sunken ships, forgotten cemeteries, they will come. From royal tombs and grassy battlefields, they will come. From Abel, the first to die, to the person being buried at the moment the trumpet sounds, everybody will be raised. Everybody will. And here's the thing I know about, about movie previews. They always leave the story unresolved. You walk away wondering how's it going to end, how's it going to play out, how's it going to unfold. And what you need to just acknowledge right now is that you, you are in the middle of the story. This story's not done yet. This story's not finished yet. You're in the middle of it. And so you may be experiencing loss and pain, confusion, frustration, brokenness, grief, poverty. I don't know what it is you're experiencing right now, but this is not the time to give up on God. Because the future reality is coming. Your story's not yet finished. Pain and death do not get the last word. The resurrection promises that. Easter's your hope. And the resurrection of Jesus is your assurance. And the miracles of Jesus give you a glimpse of what is to come so that you can have confidence in a better future that God's gonna give you, a better plan for you. So don't let the ceiling of your imagination hold you back from the confident expectation of a better future. And so just as John, uh, Jesus said to John the Baptist, blessed are you, if you don't stumble on account of me that you're going to go through trouble in this life, he is saying that to you. Blessed are you when you keep your faith and your confidence and your hope in Jesus to carry you all the way to glory. He's given you the miracles to prove it. He's risen from the dead to prove it. It's going to happen. That's his assurance. Your brokenness will be restored. Beauty is going to come from ashes. New life is yours. You will go from death to life again. It's real. So believe it. Trust it. Lean into it. I'd like to call uh, Traven to join me, who's been helping us lead worship today, and our, our worship team is going to come out. But I, I wanted to ask Traven just a couple questions real quick, because as Corey said earlier, Traven's been playing the Apostle John for an entire year now at Sight and Sound Theater. How many of you have already been there and seen Jesus at Sight and Sound, okay? So uh, I'm seeing some hands through there, but many more of you have got to go. It's still playing, it's gonna keep going. It's, it's incredible. Uh, our family, we, we've been, we went, in fact, that was my 50th birthday, was we, we all went to go see it. And I just wanted to let Traven just speak into this for a minute, because here he is, he's been playing the Apostle John the disciple that Jesus loved, the closest disciple to Jesus, he's doing this day in and day out, week in and week out, just kind of living what it's like to spend time with Jesus in a sense. And I, I just wanted to ask Traven just to share with, with us, Traven, just what, what have your emotions and your feelings been like being this close to Jesus? Um, putting yourself in the place of John in that moment, and what has that been like, just emotionally and, and relationally through that? Um, so I've done the show probably about 450 uh, times. Out of those times, I've probably cried at least 400 to 425 times uh, as I'm taking the body off of the cross. Um, just 
bearing the body that bore our sins and grief, uh, just really thinking about that and having to carry that and feeling the emotions of the, of the audience, feeling my own emotions, um, it's a lot. It's a lot. There's a sense of conviction, um, but there's also a sense of responsibility to make sure we're living out the higher call that God is calling us to. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And as you reflect back on that time, uh, have there been moments through all of those stories, all those interactions, have there been any moments when you just came away saying, wow, that that is an example of the new life that God is doing something new. Jesus is doing something. New. Is there any moments for you personally, just even as you've played that role where you were just like, this is when Jesus is doing something new? I, I will say all of them, but the moment uh, when he calls Lazarus forth from the grave. Um, one of the things about that that really sticks out to me as well is that um, everyone else, every other uh, depiction that we have in the show, we see the other party. So we see the blind man, we see Mary Mag, we see uh, the leper, we don't see Lazarus. So it literally takes Jesus speaking a word, mm-hmm. saying come forth, and just showing up on the scene, Mary and Martha like, why aren't you here? If you were here, you know, this wouldn't have happened. But seeing Jesus do that, it's just really giving us a glimpse of what he's going to do later on. Yeah, so, yeah. absolutely. You know, it's interesting that Jesus, the same one who's going to call people out of their graves, the same one that is going to, through his command and voice, see dead bodies raised to new life and joined with their spirit, was the same one whose voice called out to Lazarus, saying, come, come out of that grave. Come out of your deadness. Come to new life. And that is the invitation that Jesus is giving to each and every single one of you right here, right now. I mean, this is the invitation of Easter, is that dead things don't have to stay dead. Dead things get to come to life again because of the power of the resurrection. And what you need is a spiritual resurrection right here, right now, knowing that one day you're gonna get that physical resurrection too. This is why whenever we read in scripture about people coming to Jesus, that one of the first things they have to believe is that Jesus is Lord, he's God, and that he rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. Romans 10, 9 says you have to confess that. You have to believe that with all your heart. He rose from the dead. If you don't believe that, you're not coming to life. If he didn't, you're not. We believe that he came to life again. This is why in Colossians 2, it it tells us that for every single person who has believed and put their faith in the Lord, then, then when you're baptized into Christ, Colossians 2 says. It reveals that when you're buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through your faith, it's meaningless without faith, your faith in Jesus. It says you were raised with him through faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead. The reason we can come to life again is because we have faith that God brought Jesus to life and Jesus has the power to bring us to life. He raises dead things to life. He wants to give you new life. And today we just want to invite you today to believe, to confess your sins, to repent, to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, to be baptized into Christ where you identify with him in his death and in his resurrection. And if you have not yet done that, or you need to do that, or you want to talk about doing that, or you need to pray with someone today, we want to give you a chance to do it. So after this video plays, you can meet me right over at Decision Point, or if you're watching online, just go to northsidechristianchurch.net slash decision and begin that conversation with us. I'd love to meet you there, but let's give our attentions to the screen.